Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of May 18th, 2020. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.20 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. Because of the time we spent on each, this week Michael and I only covered the first two of our usual three issues. Those two were, first, our view of what is happening with the legislature in Juneau this week and what that means for the upcoming election cycle. And second, our view of an ADN op-ed that Charles Wolforth wrote this week, trying to pin the blame for the state's current fiscal situation on certain individuals. We think he is missing a key player. And now, let's join Michael. Let's uh, take a look at your weekly top three today. Today we start off with the uh, the legislature um, down in Juneau, uh, and uh, what what should what should they be focusing on? What should, why don't you take us away here for number one? Well, the the discussion before they went down there, there was all sorts of discussion about uh, additional things they should be doing, potential things they could be doing in addition to focusing on the. Uh, governor's allocations of the of the CARES Act money, um, and some people uh, have put have tried to push the legislature to uh, do veto overrides. You know, we, when when we left this story uh, back a couple of months ago, uh, the governor had uh, issued vetoes for some of the uh, appropriations, and there was uh, some discussion of. Uh, down at the legislature's back trying to, to do overrides of the vetoes. Others uh, had uh, pushed uh, uh, for uh, the legislature to take up PFDs again uh, and potentially do a supplemental appropriation uh, for, uh, for uh, additional PFDs uh, over and above the, the amount uh, set in the appropriation. Um, and others had pushed uh, for changes in the allocations of the CARES Act money, uh, the governor set the allocations between uh, lo- locations and and between industries and and set it and set the amount uh, uh, for uh, uh, grants to small business. And some had been pushing for changes to uh, to those allocations and, and and a redo of the allocations between communities. Um, it appears, at this 10 seconds at least, that none of those additional things uh, are going to happen. There was nothing when the uh, when the legislature met yesterday about uh, about veto overrides, no mention uh, uh, of it whatsoever. Um, and the Constitution requires, if the legislature is still in session, which it is, that the that the that the legislature take up uh, veto overrides uh, immediately. Uh, if they are in session, uh, and and there was no effort to to do that, so I think that uh, that push uh, by some uh, to to have overrides uh, has has come and gone. Uh, there's been no discussion of by by legislators, and there were no bills, and there there were no there were no efforts in uh, in either of the committees that met yesterday to deal with additional PFD appropriations or to take up any uh, bill to uh, 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 push the, or add additional PFDs or to, or to change the timing uh, of the PFDs. Um, and there, uh, uh, while there was some discussion in Senate finance, which had uh, 
which heard the uh, the CARES Act uh, ratification bill, some discussion about uh, concerns about the allocation the governor was making in the distribution of the CARES Act. Uh, there was a recognition in the committee uh, that that the form of legislation that that the legislature is going to use to do the ratification of the CARES Act allocations does not permit uh, amendment either in committee or on the floor. Um, so uh, there was the. the at the end of the day, both the House Rules Committee, which was hearing the ratification bill, and the Senate Finance Committee, which was hearing the ratification of the of the CARES Act allocations, neither of those, but both of those, uh, approved the bills um, and uh, and sent them on to uh, to the to the next uh, spot. In the in the case of the House, it goes from Rules Committee to the floor. Uh, in the case of the Senate, it goes from Senate Finance to uh, to Senate Rules. That's all important. I mean, the fact that there was no movement on any of those other things yesterday uh, is is important uh, because the legislature adjourns uh, at the end of the 120 day at the end of its 120 days, constitutional 120 days is uh, is Wednesday at midnight. Um, and if there were going if there was going to be any movement. Uh, on any of those additional things, it would have had to have been started yesterday, right? Uh, uh, to have time to get to the floor and, and be acted on. So, I think we're going to end this end this session um, uh, with just the, uh, uh, the ratification of the of the CARES Act uh, allocations and the CARES Act uh, uh, spending, and uh, maybe one or two other bills that. Uh, had gotten through one of the legislative bodies, but was still pending before the before the other body when uh, when when everybody dropped and left. Um, but nothing in terms of uh, veto override or additional PFD or changes to the governor's RPLs. I, I think that's I, I think they're going to come uh, do the ratification and go home. So I guess this this begs the question. Uh, do you think that, that that this was kind of the you know the plutonium of the whole session? They didn't want to be the ones that were holding up and bogging down the aid money from the federal government that that maybe they heard from their constituencies that now is not the time to fight this battle. Or what's your take on it? Yeah, I think I think the, there's a general recognition that if you open any of this up, uh, if you if you started down the road of allowing amendments to the CARES Act allocations. Or if you started down the road of, of of an additional PFD or trying to put an additional PFD in the middle of the CARES Act allocations, uh, that they were going to be there a heck of a lot longer uh, than Wednesday, and that creates all sorts of issues because they would then have to go into special session, and the governor would either have to call them into special session or the uh, or the uh, uh, the legislature itself would have to take itself into special session, which requires for the legislature to do it would require a two thirds vote. Um, and I don't. And I, I, my sense is the general sense is that they don't have two thirds to call themselves into general into a special session. I'm not sure the governor would do it. I'm, I'm not sure the governor sees an upside uh, to doing that. So uh, I think they just want to get this done in the in the time remaining and get out of there. And opening up any of it, I think uh, the concern is that uh, that they wouldn't get it done within within the the remaining two days. Brad Keithley. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We're talking about the weekly top three. So does that mean that all these ideas that they've been floating around and some of these other things are dead for this session? And do they even get picked up next session in light of the budget problems that we're going to be facing uh, moving forward? Yeah, I think they're dead for this session. Um, there's been some discussion. I mean, Natasha occasionally will will surface with some discussion about uh, having a special session to deal with a capital budget uh, or or other things, but I just don't see a whole lot of a whole lot of interest uh, in the legislature, broadly speaking, in the legislature um, to to deal with those additional issues. I, they're going to go into campaign mode. Those that are up for election, the 40 in the House, the 20 in the, or the 10 in the Senate that are that are up for election, they're going to go into campaign mode. Uh, after uh, after Wednesday, because they'll be out of session, they can fundraise, they can start campaigning, they can start uh, soliciting uh, 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 contributions, um, and some of them are going to have primaries, and they're going to want to do that. I just don't I don't see an appetite. I don't see a place where they come back, uh, where they where they the 
decide they want to come back and deal with something. Now, maybe if we have a second wave of COVID, um, uh, maybe if uh, if uh, uh, Congress passes uh, an additional appropriations bill uh, that requires legislative action, uh, maybe that brings them back for a for a short period, just like uh, just like they're doing now. Uh, but I just don't see I don't see an appetite to, to come back for a prolonged session in, in any of these issues. The PFD, uh, the, the uh, changing the CARES Act allocations, veto any of those issues, I think would open up a can of worms, and would and I think the perception is would keep them there for an extended period. So, I my again, this is sort of at, at this ten seconds, but but my sense is that uh, this is it. Uh, for this legislative year, uh, we're off to uh, the election cycle, um, and uh, and we'll see them again. Uh, we'll see the new legislature when they come back uh, in January. Care to pontificate on what you think this means for the um, for the uh, uh, election cycle? I mean, you just mentioned it. You know, they don't really have a lot of time. They can't. They can't. Uh, uh, you know, they can't electioneer while they are in uh, session and everything else, which is another reason why they. Probably wouldn't call themselves back in, but any uh, any pontification on what this means for the election cycle, especially for some of those who have started now to be painted as the ones who either spent the money or took the PFDs or both, uh, and some of the people who may have stood up against this uh, CARES Act money and some of the other things that are going on? Well, I think it means everybody, they're just locked in their positions. I mean, let's just pick Chuck Cop. Who's uh, who's going to have a, a, a primary uh, opponent, uh, or let's pick Jennifer Johnson, who's going to have a primary opponent. Um, this may, if they wanted to do it, this might have provided the opportunity to sort of soften their rough edge on the PFD issue. Um, uh, they might have, they might have, this might have been the opportunity to say, oh, these are special times and. And you know we're going to make an excess ERA draw or or something of the sort and try to soften their their edge on that. Uh, they're not doing it, so they're sort of they're sort of locking down uh, on on the positions they've taken uh, to this point, and they're going to stand on them uh, in this election cycle. Um, and I and I think that I mean so they're going to go into it with a with a with whatever hard edge they've come out of the session. In terms of being anti-PFD, or in terms of you know being pro top 20 percent, or, or whatever whatever position they're in, uh, they're going to come out of this. Uh, they're going to come out of this session with that hard edge, um, and and I think they've made the judgment uh, in in whether 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 proactively or just you know the circumstances have forced them into it. I think they've made the judgment that that's what they'll ride on through the election cycle. Um, and I think that's going to—I think it's going to be tough for COP uh, in, in that district uh, in particular. Uh, I think it's going to be tough, tough for John Coghill, and you know we can, we can we, we will at points go through the go through the the full litany of who's running against who, and 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 who's going to have to you know live with positions that are that are not great positions. Uh, but that that's where they're doing. I mean, we blocked in. This is this is where the election cycle is going to be. Uh, they're not going to moderate their positions, and uh, and we're just going to we're going to go with that. Uh, the Geldhoff lawsuit. Uh, do you think it just fades away now? I mean, that's what the word was, or do you think that they try and continue something now that they've pushed it to this point? Willikowski said something in legislative finance yesterday that uh, is intriguing. Um, Willikowski said he doesn't that he didn't think that what they were doing uh, with uh, with the RPL, with the with the ratification of the RPL, he didn't think that was satisfied uh, the standards of an appropriation because he couldn't amend it. They couldn't move for amendments. They couldn't have a debate and discussion over individual amendments. There wasn't an opportunity for that either in committee or on the floor, uh, given the way they were doing it. Um, and and Bill said he didn't think that satisfied the criteria for an appropriation. If if Joe if Geldhoff wants to continue the suit, that will be the issue he continues it on. Um, I don't think that you're going to find a judge who's going to uh, issue an injunction against the CARES Act distributions. Um, and and so if the suit does continue on that issue, it will be more uh, an esoteric 
decision about or an esoteric uh, uh, issue about uh, whether if this ever comes up again, the legislature can do it in the same way they did it this time. Uh, but it's it's a possibility. Uh, it continues it. Um, I think uh, part of the reason for the lawsuit, frankly, I mean, Joe's a, Joe's a member of the PFD Defenders Group, and I think part of the reason for the lawsuit, frankly, was to get the led, was to force the legislature to come back and, and and be in a position where, if they wanted to take up the PFD, uh, or, where some might be able to force it force them to take up the PFD. Uh, if that was an objective, uh, that objective I think has failed, um, and so there wouldn't be a reason to continue to the lawsuit uh, for that reason. But it, it's an interesting legal point, you know, among among lawyers about whether what they're doing satisfies the appropriations process. So Joe, Joe may continue to pursue that. I think it's interesting, Brad, that you bring up the uh, bring up the fact that this may have been a move by Geldhoff and Forer, who are also, again, uh, pushing for this full uh, for the full PFD with the PFD defenders. Geldhoff has been a guest on this program to talk about the legality of that and stuff in the past. Uh, that's an interesting take that I hadn't really considered that they may have been trying to force the hands of people to try and get them back to the table and, you know, put them on record for a vote. I, I guess I hadn't considered that. Well, that's that's actually was the first thing that struck me when I saw Joe was bringing the suit. Um, I mean, it's it's it was timed around. We, we've had these rolling uh, 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 rallies for the PFD in various locations throughout the state. We've had an increase in in chatter on social media, uh, pushing for uh, the legislature to readdress the PFD. Uh, we've had people talking about whether the governor could move up the PFD, whether the governor could make additional distributions. We had the the Begich uh, Parnell uh, uh, Commission or committee or whatever it was, uh, task force uh, talking about uh, the need for additional PFD distribution. Uh, there's been a lot of a lot of you know sort of. Not not high level, but a lot of chatter uh, about uh, about the need for additional PFDs, um, and and this sort of plopped the the RPL process sort of plopped uh, right in the middle uh, or or sort of at, at, toward the toward the beginning of of that increased chatter, or maybe right in the middle of the, of the increased chatter, and and I saw Joe's suit. Uh, I, I this is just me, but I saw Joe's suit as sort of an opportunistic move to, to force the legislature to get back together again uh, and, uh, and and open up the possibility of dealing with the PFD. Now, as I said, I don't think that's I don't think that's going to happen. I think everybody's just trying to get out of town, get this done and get out of town. Uh, but it, 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 if that wasn't the purpose of it, it was a great <laughs> it, was, it was a great coincidence uh, that it had the effect of bringing the legislature back to judo. Right, right, right. Well, uh, it uh, interestingly enough, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm concerned about the, uh, I'm concerned about the election cycle, quite honestly, um, because here we have a bunch of incumbents. Uh, we've shortened the window down. We've got the COVID virus. People, you know, money is tight for people. People are worried about, uh, you know, the COVID and everything else and all the other aspects of the economy. Um, and while for some people this may sharpen their attention on what's going on in government because they maybe they believe government hasn't handled things properly or whatever, other people are going to be so consumed by all the other stuff going on and worrying about whether they have a job and everything else that that may mean that people don't pay attention, that some of these challengers may not get the support that they need uh, going forward. Um, how do you read that? How do you, how do you see it? You know, I think that depends on Dunleavy. Uh, the the one the one thing that can break that sort of 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 you know lack of attention uh, to the issue is the governor. If the governor if the governor would get out there and campaign and say, look, in order to fulfill my campaign promises of two promises of two years ago, which is what you elected me on, uh, in order to fulfill those promises, I need a legislature that will work with me. Uh, to, uh, toward toward these objectives, and 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 I have not had a legislature that's done that. So that means we need we need new people uh, down here. I think the governor um, uh, could be the, the 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 force that would break that sort of malaise or that sort of uh, 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 sort of continuation that you, that you're describing. Um, absent that, uh, 
absent him getting out there and campaigning for a legislature that will support him, uh, I think I, I fear you're right that the that the there won't be the kind of the, the kind of response that that changes the players. But I think the governor could be it could be a, a changing factor. Now, would that spike the efforts to uh, uh, to recall him? Uh, would that run the risk of recalling him? And and is is that the overriding concern to everything uh, in the governor's office that they want to avoid anything that spikes that? Uh, maybe. Uh, but you know, the, the, for 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 the governor to achieve the objectives, achieve the the the, the plan, uh, the platform that he ran on two years ago, he's going to have to change the legislature. And if he doesn't get out there to help change the legislature, if he doesn't go to, on the campaign trail to help change the legislature, um, to me, that's sort of a sign that he's another sign, maybe, but a sign that he's giving up on. Uh, uh, on those objectives, and he's just going to glide through the the, well, the next two years of his term. I, I think he's dead either way. Either he, you know, either he spurs on the recall effort by, you know, supporting a turnover in the legislature, or he becomes a lame duck and he irritates all the people who supported him because he wishes out on it. Uh, I think either way he could be dead. I mean, so you might as well go down swinging as far as that goes. I mean, it, you know. You got you got cut you know you got tugboat captain Ben back there you know calling some of these shots that I think are very safe and very business as usual and what we don't what we don't need right now is business as usual. So we got through number one. We're on to number two. Uh, this article from Charles Wolferth in the ADN, Brad, that talks uh, specifically about hey we're out of money. Shocker. Where how did that happen? Who's to blame for this? Uh, like my gosh, I didn't didn't you know we didn't see this coming. I mean, I'm being a little facetious here, but like all of a sudden somebody noticed that we've been spending all the money down. I mean, what we've been talking about for five years on this program, uh, all of a sudden everybody else is just noticing. And Wolf Earth points some fingers, uh, but uh, as usual, there's way too much blame to go around into one court. Uh, does he get it right or get it wrong? No, oh, I think he gets it wrong. So. So the title, if, if people haven't read it, the title of the, of the op-ed is in the ADN is Tough Times Arrive and Alaska's Cupboard is Bare. Whose fault is that? And the, and the gist of, of Charles' uh, effort uh, in this piece is to blame, uh, blame the Republicans um, who failed to respond to Governor Walker's, I, I, I'll put words in, in Charles's mouth, enlightened plan. Uh, for uh, uh, a variety of taxes, um, uh, and the and the and the Republicans' failure to uh, to adopt that, that's the reason, according to Charles, that uh, that we're in that we're in the shape we're in. Um, and it's to some degree it's electioneering. It's uh, to some degree it's you know as we go into this election cycle, who do you want to blame for for the 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 situation the state finds itself in and the and the difficulties we're going to have to face now through the the through the remainder of the decade. Um, and Charles is trying to set up a case that it's the Republicans that failed, and so all these Democrat challengers that are that are out in the various districts, the, the representative districts largely, uh, will be able to say, "Look, it was the Republicans who failed, and, and you need to put Democrats Democrats in charge to, you know, to restore the uh, to restore the legislature." I my reaction as I read through the article was uh, Charles has the timeline right. Um, but he's got the wrong, the wrong key player, the wrong, uh, the wrong actor that, that really uh, caused everything to go down. I, I think, you know, when you, when you look back on it, uh, the, the key decision, uh, that, uh, that has led us to the shape we're in, uh, was governor Walker's decision, uh, in 2016, uh, to cut the PFD, to, to veto a portion of the PFD, um, and use that indirectly um, uh, to to help uh, to help support state spending. Uh, that decision uh, up to that point, uh, there was a lot of pressure on for the for the legislature and for the governor uh, to do something. There was an increasing recognition that we were in uh, a fiscally challenging uh, challenged environment. There was a movement. Uh, to try to deal with that in some fashion, um, and and a movement to try to deal with it by some to to reduce spending, to reduce government programs, a movement by others to find uh, equitable uh, revenue approaches uh, to to raise additional revenue. Which, frankly, I think if it had been done equitably, 
uh, would have put increased pressure on reducing spending because all Alaska families would have, you know, would have had skin in the game to try to push back on spending. Governor Walker's decision to use the PFD, to cut the PFD and use that as the mechanism uh, to fund government, uh, to me, was the key because it let the pressure off. Um, it, all of a sudden, you know, we'd been facing these uh, a growing fiscal, a growing realization that we had a fiscal problem, a growing uh, 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 effort to to try to deal with that in, in some fashion or another. And all of a sudden, Walker's cut of the PFD said, well, that's going to be the solution. Uh, we're going to we're going to just use the PFD as, as another piggy bank, as another savings, uh, another uh, uh, fiscal bladder, if you will. Uh, and, and that's how we'll fund government. Right. Um, and and that then, because of the way the PFD tilts to middle, it puts the burden on middle and lower income Alaska families, that let the top 20 percent off the hook. Uh, and the top 20 percent are, are important not only because that's most of the legislature, most of the legislatures in the top 20 percent, that's most of the funders uh, and most of the most of the, 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 the social groups that, that legislators uh, uh, deal with. Uh, and so all of a sudden we had a funding mechanism that didn't hurt, that didn't that didn't involve the top 20 percent, didn't bring their skin in the game, didn't put their skin in the game. And and so the pressure was off. Um, and now the, the next time if we keep going down this road, the next time we hit pressure is once we've consumed all the PFD and that's a billion and a half uh, or more. Uh, depending upon whether you're talking about POMB 5050 or a statutory PFD, that's a billion and a half or more uh, of, of additional fiscal uh, legroom per year. Addis- additional fiscal legroom we just gave just gave government uh, to, to to spend out uh, without having to face the pressure. So I I, I, appreciate, I mean Charles is always to me entertaining in the sense that. In the sense that it, you sort of you sort of wonder how he's going to weave this story together, um, and he does a way of doing it. You sort of you know chuckle or I chuckle as I go through it. But but to me the key the key point was when and he misses this entirely. Uh, the key point is when Walker uh, used the PFD as as the funding mechanism and took the pressure off the top twenty percent. Brad Keithley is our guest, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. He goes on to pri- he goes on, of course, to blame the uh, Republicans uh, as a whole for their overspending, uh, while kind of giving the Democrats a pass on this. I say there's plenty of blames to go around. There were plenty of big big spending Republicans who were in there, but they couldn't have done it without the help of the of the minority and the Democrats over over these years. Because they're the ones that had to negotiate, especially with the CBR and the sweeps and the reverse sweeps. They had to give out a lot of things to the Democrats to get that, you know, everybody had to have their piece of pie. And so there's plenty of blame. I mean, the Republicans led the charge. Don't get me wrong. I agree with that. But there's plenty of blame to go around to basically all the politicians who've been in the legislature for the last 10 or 15 years. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I, uh, I, don't, I don't think you can – I don't think you can blame – Democrats alone for the spending. I don't think you can blame Republicans alone for the spending. There, there was this, there was a symbiotic re- relationship between the two. I mean, the, the Republicans were better at at sort of talking about spending as an issue, but when push came to shove, they didn't do anything about it. Um, the Democrats never really, you know, uh, uh, talked up overspending as an issue. It was always, oh, we have to have this program or that program or the other program. Um, but you're right. I mean, their votes were necessary, and you and you see it, you see it in the House majority. Uh, uh, Republicans who want to protect the top 20 percent came together with Democrats who want to continue spending, and they all continued spending. Uh, and 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 Republicans did it. Chuck Cobb, Jennifer Johnson continued spending uh, because they had this this unholy alliance with the Democrats that they would fund this additional spending through PFD cuts, um, and and leave the top 20 percent out of it. So you know. The, the top 20 percent Republicans said, yeah, we don't care. I'm, yeah, we're, we'll talk about spending. We'll, we'll, we'll talk like we're Republicans, but we really don't care. And we'll just join in with, with Democrats and continue spending as long as they promise not to you know, try to take money out of our, out of, out of, out of our income bracket. So, yeah, uh, yeah they're, they're, the, the blame goes both ways. I, the, the blame goes both on spending, 
the blame goes both to uh, both the Republicans and the, the Democrats. The irony of that, of course, is that the Republicans, especially those in the top 20 percent, were doing their best to protect their constituency, while it seems like the Democrats, in throwing uh, the PFD away, really were, in a lot of ways, especially rural Democrats, were throwing their constituents under the bus. So, I mean, there's plenty of blame to go around in both directions, but... Uh, uh, I find that kind of ironic. Uh, last 60 seconds, Brad, we're not going to get to number three, but your final thoughts. Well, I, yes, uh, it, it sort of depends on who you think the Democrats' constituents are. Uh, are the Democrats' constituents the middle and lower income Alaska residents of their districts? Or are their constituents the, the government, the, the government uh, employees that provide services and government programs that provide income? Uh, uh, support uh, to those districts. I, I, Neil Foster has always fascinated me. I mean, Neil Foster he represents the poorest district in the state, but he's been one of the one of those who's who's allowed PFD cuts to go forward. And as I as I dealt dev, uh, uh, dived into it, what's going on with Neil is he's trying to support government programs and government employees out in his district. And it's sort of like you know, yes, I understand it's going to cost my constituents, the middle and lower income of Alaska families in my district, uh, money. But but these government programs are what's really important, and these government employees is what's really important, and that's what holds the district. Well, that's an interesting point, Brad. I mean, let's go back to that real quick. Uh, you know, Neil Foster apparently believes that the government spending and the government services are much more important than the people having the money in their own hands, which kind of goes right back hand in glove to what we've talked about for a long time, that that the vast majority of politicians across the country, but in this state as well, seem to believe that mantra of we know better than you how to spend that money, that those government programs are much more beneficial to you and your family than if you had this money in your hand to be able to spend as you see fit. Yeah, exactly right. I mean, they, 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 view, <coughs> uh, they, they view maintaining those that government support for their for their constituencies or for their districts uh, as as of overriding importance yes it's going to take money out of out of the family's pockets but but look you get all these government services uh, in exchange it's sort of it's sort of this this bargain of of yes we know that the that the burdens being shoved off on middle and lower income Alaska families uh, but you're sort of we're sort of taking your money and buying all these services for you and look, you get these services. We know we know it's costing you, but but you get these services. And, and the really the thing that just you know just makes me sort of boil over when I think about it that way is that they're keeping people in poverty. They're, I mean, so ICER has a study that says there's this huge impact on poverty levels uh, uh, from from PFD cuts, or there's a huge positive impact. On, on taking people out of poverty if you pay them the PFD. So they're keeping their constituents in poverty. They're keeping a, a lot of their constituents in poverty. They're keeping their constituents uh, qualified for these government programs uh, 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 and then telling them that, you know, that's okay because we're buying you these government programs. You get to have these government programs. It's just, it, it's, this, it's this horrible circle of, of dependency uh, that, that that's created out there uh, as opposed to, uh, the positive effects of of giving them the royalty they deserve, the, the the oil royalty they deserve, and letting them make their make their own choices. I mean, Jennifer Johnson goes down the same road when she when she made her statement about uh, about well, you know what they use the PFD for out there in the in the bush, right? I mean, right, it's right. Just, there's this sense of of of, of we know better. Um, we legislators know better, and this sense of yes, we know we're going to keep you in poverty, but that's okay because we're giving you a bunch of services. Oh, and by the way, we get to employ all these people who then these government employees who then will vote for us and give us contributions and that sort of stuff. I mean, it's it it, it it's a bad circle that we've gotten into, um, and I and I'm and and, and it's disappointing uh, that you that you have representatives out in the bush that 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 are keeping that circle going as opposed to trying to find ways to lift their constituents out of poverty, allow them to have the, to have the revenue that uh, the Governor Hammond envisioned for them. Well, it's creating that dependency class, right? I mean, that's the, <clears throat> the dependency cycle you just mentioned. That's what this is all about, creating a whole class of people that have become dependent on the government and continuing that dependency no matter what. Yeah, and I'm sure, I'm sure Neil thinks he's doing the right thing, and and... 
and and I you know I, I I can't get fully in Neil's mind. I'm sure he thinks he's doing the right thing for his constituents, but but it's just an attitude. The attitude is the, is the attitude they're not going to be able to do it themselves. The government needs to do it for them. And we need we need this revenue in order for government to do it for them. And I know that keeps them down in poverty, but that's too bad because they we need they need us to do this for them. Is it's that attitude as opposed to let's get them out of poverty. Let's get them the revenue that 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 that, that they're entitled to, um, and and let them make their own decisions in life, and let them, you know, and let them let them live their lives with the revenue that that they sh- that they should have. Um, and it's you're just I mean I'm 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 disappointed that the attitude is that's okay let's just keep them independent. See, government knows best. Uh, we know better how to spend their money than they do, and we'll just we'll just keep uh, keep with this cycle. I. That's not a cycle that I think is is long term productive for sure people anywhere, uh, but that's the cycle that we're that we're continually going in by by using PFDs uh, PFD cuts to to fund uh, to fund government, and it has the secondary effect of you know Neil's in the top twenty percent, other legislators in the top twenty percent, they don't have to pay for it. They're getting they're getting their middle and lower income of uh, uh, families in their districts and elsewhere in the state to pay for it, so they get to be these benevolent uh, uh, government uh, handout uh, people, uh, but they don't have to pay for it themselves. I, it's just I, it, we've just set this system up wrong. Um, and and to, to break the cycle, uh, we've got to give people the money that they're entitled to. Um, and and if, we're, if we need more money, take it out of all Alaska families so that all Alaska families are are making the judgment about whether government spending levels are where they should be. Uh, Chuck, <clears throat> Chuck said uh, uh, just a second ago, he said, Donna Arduin knew how to fix things, but Dunleavy let her go out of fear, I think. I think it would. I think that's probably been the biggest mistake that has been made so far is letting Donna Ardu- Arduin out of the picture. you got about a minute here. Yes. I mean, she didn't know how to fix things. But, but you know, Michael, you and I knew how to fix things. True. I mean, I mean true. Uh, there's a lot of people that knew how to fix things. It, it, the governor, the governor, ultimately chose not to fix them. Has has chosen thus far not to fix them. That's really the key. I mean, Donna, Donna was great at identifying how they were, uh, but there were other people who who could have identified uh, what they were as well. Um, and the governor cho- just chose not to go in that direction. Uh, it's disappointing. Uh, and as I say, he's got one more chance in this election cycle to step up and say, look, I need a legislature that will work with me. Um, whether he does that you know, is, 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 is not a clear proposition, but, but this is sort of his last chance to get a legislature he can work with his last well, few years. Well, you're only as good as the people you surround yourself with, and if that's the case, we got some serious issues, I think is kind of what that boils down to. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaska's for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you, my friend. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Appreciate you being on board. Well, that's a wrap on another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.